So uh, hello to you, uh, dear brethren. Today I would like to talk about a God-fearing bad man, as uh, he is presented in the Bible in the Old Testament. We will be in the book of Numbers, chapter 22. Uh, the story continues also in uh, chapter 23 and chapter 24. So in total, there are three chapters in the book of Numbers which uh, speak about this uh, God-fearing bad man. But I'm not going to read all the three chapters because it would take a lot of uh, time. We will concentrate on the most important chapter number 22. And then I will just uh, describe uh, what is uh, describe it briefly what is written in chapters 23 and uh, 24. But before we go on, let's talk about the title of the discourse, A God-Fearing Bad Man. I think that uh, we can see this uh, contrast, because usually a God-fearing person is not a bad person. Usually it is a good person. And in the Bible, we've got uh, one character, one man, who was a bad person because uh, there was evil in his heart, but he was also a God-fearing person. That's uh, quite exceptional. That's uh, what made me interested in this uh, story. And I started to study it and then created this uh, discourse some years uh, ago. Of course, I'm going to talk about the man who was called Balaam. There was such a person in Old Testament times. And especially what interested me was the fact that when you read chapters 22, 23, and 24, you cannot see anything evil done by this man. Okay? Because the, it's a, the story of a man itself does not provide us with any evil deeds of uh, this uh, man. But then, when you go to the New Testament, because this Balaam is mentioned a few times in the New Testament, the New Testament speaks of him badly. But why? That's uh, why I decided to study this story, to learn myself why he was such a bad man. And the apostles speak so badly of uh, him. So let us go to this uh, story. Okay, you can read with me if you want, chapter uh, 22nd of the book of Numbers. I'm going to read all this chapter as it is presented in New King James Version of the Bible. So the story goes like this. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab, on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Sipor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us, as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Petor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight. And I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, 
and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me, perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them, you shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me, Therefore, please come, curse these people for me. Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, please you also stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, so Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord sent to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border of the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not earnestly send to you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? 
And Balaam said to Balak, Look, I have come to you. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kibjat Husom. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. That's uh, the 22nd story, the most important one uh, to us. Uh, and in this uh, chapter, we've got uh, recorded probably the only instance in the history that an animal spoke in a human voice uh, with uh, with a human, with Balaam. The donkey really spoke with uh, Balaam. I don't know whether it is the same in your country, but in uh, Poland, there is an old superstition belief that on Christmas Eve at midnight, animals speak with a human voice. But of course, we know it to, to be only a superstition, not uh, truth. But this is the only true instance when an animal really spoke in a human voice. It was a miracle which God performed to show something here. So that's the story of uh, Balaam. Then if we were to go to chapter 23, we would read about burnt offerings uh, that he offer that he made about the prophecies, uh, which uh, the first prophecy, the second prophecy, and the third prophecy. We can uh, say that uh, none of the words he said were a curse, as Balak wanted, because all the time when uh, Balaam opened his uh, mouth to speak, the Lord Spirit spoke through him, and these were wonderful blessings for Israel, not curses as Balak wanted. Uh, if you if you are, would be interested, you could read the 23rd and 24th chapters because, well, we can even these prophecies, we can treat them as beautiful poetry, as beautiful poems. Some of them present millennial blessings which will come to the world through Israel. But uh, let us return to our story and to the, what it means. We will concentrate on that now. So we've got this uh, Balaam. As we can see uh, from uh, what I have read, uh, he is not an Israelite. He does. He's not a member of Israel. He was a man who lived somewhere quite far away. He lived in, uh, in Aram or in Mesopotamia by the Euphrates, River. We can say this is more or less the same area where Abraham lived, but Abraham lived several hundred years earlier than uh, Balaam lived uh, there. And it uh, seems that uh, after the Israelites entered Canaan and they were fully recognized as the holy nation of God, uh, God stopped his contacts with heathens. However, by the time Israel entered the promised land, uh, God had recognized in a lesser or a bigger degree those individuals who had faith in him. Well, we have Abraham, we've got Job, who was not an Israelite at all, we have Melchizedek, and we've got Balaam, who is the hero of today's talk. So uh, I would like uh, to give you the context of the story. So first thing, when was it? Well, we could say that it was something like uh, 3,600 3, years ago. It was the 16th century before Christ, when the events described in the story took place. Uh, where was it? It was, on the, as the Bible says, on the steppe of Moab, on the eastern side of the River Jordan, opposite Jericho. Well, in, during the symposium, one of the brethren showed you the, the Jordan River, so it was on the eastern side, which would mean that if you were looking at the map and the river going from the north-south, it was to the right of the river. The eastern sign would be to the right of the river, where we had Moabs, the steps of Moab on the eastern side of the river Jordan. That's, and when was it? What was the situation? Uh, the Israelis, the Isra Israelites, after leaving Egypt, 
where they were in captivity for a very long period. You remember the story, how Joseph first went to Israel as a slave, then Jacob with all his family came. They lived there for a long time, multiplied greatly. The pharaohs started to see danger in them and they oppressed and the pharaohs oppressed them. You know the story. And under Moses' leadership, they left uh, Egypt. They passed through the Red uh, Sea. And then they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And now we are at this moment that they are preparing to enter the promised land. They are very close to it and on the point of entering the promised land. So this is the situation. What is uh, more, the Israelites on their way fight because there are nations that the Lord tells them to defeat, even we can say to eradicate completely from the face of the earth. And, you know, these are very significant events and news about such events spreads very quickly. So the neighboring nations, all the people living there in the uh, Middle East learn about that and uh, they become afraid okay and we've got Balak here the king of Moab who becomes filled with terrible fear he is afraid that the Israelites will attack him and his kingdom and destroy all of them and he as the king feels responsible for his nation he, he feels that it is up to him to do something about him he knows that his military might is not enough to defeat the Israelites. So what do people do in such a situation? Well, they either look for allies or look for some wonderful things. Oh, I just, uh, when I was saying that a moment ago, I remembered that during the, sec during the Second World War, when Hitler was losing the war, the Germans also started to look for uh, Wunderwaffe which would mean the wonderful weapon, something new which would enable them to turn the war to their advantage. Uh, they, they, they were not able to, luckily for everybody, they were not able to find this uh, wonderful uh, new weapon because <clears throat> the Americans did, because there was a new weapon that could turn uh, the war, that was the atomic bomb and the Germans were also working on it but they didn't uh, manage to achieve uh, that but let us okay this was uh, just going aside from my topic so let us return so uh, Balak also wanted to find some helpful something that would help him for him his wonderful weapon which he chose was Balaam and uh, Balaam was a prophet okay but we will go to to that in a moment because uh, first of all i would like to tell you that the fear of balak had no real foundation he shouldn't have feared at all the israelites were not going to attack him at all why because god told the israelites that they were to live in peace all those nations that were related to them and uh, Moab was related to them. So they were to live in peace the Edomites because uh, the Edomites were the descendants of uh, Esau and Esau was Jacob's brother. They were also to live the Moabites about whom we talk because the Moabites were the descendants of Lot and Lot was Abraham's nephew. And the Midianites were also to be left in peace by the Israelites because they were the descendants of Keturah, who was Abraham's second or third wife. It depends on how you count the wives. But anyway, they were also descendants of Abraham, like the Jews. So they lived to the east and to the south of Canaan, and Israelites were not to attack them. But it seems that Balak did not know about it. And he was full of fear. And he sent for Balaam, who lived quite far away. 
it would be about 400 miles from the place where our events are taking place in Mesopotamia by the Euphrates River. He was a prophet. He was a diviner who enjoyed a great fame even in faraway places. He was very well known for his predictions because whatever he foretold always came true. When we read Numbers chapter 22, in verse 6, we read, For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and whom you curse is cursed. In other words, we could say that he was considered an oracle. So uh, Balak's plan was to call Balaam to come here and to curse the Israelites because then he would be able to defeat the Israelites. That was his plan. Okay, so he held a council with the elders of Midian and he sent for Balaam. Um, the messenger, messengers had to cover 400 miles before they reached the Euphrates. They offered Balaam a great reward if only he would come and curse the Israelites. Balaam asked the Lord if he should go, and the answer was no. And this answer Balaam gave to the messengers. Israel is blessed, and it is forbidden to curse it. So far, nothing wrong has been done by Balaam. He's clear. But let us go on. Uh, so what happens next? Balak did not take no for an answer. He, uh, he was uh, a person of this earth, and he simply thought, well, he didn't agree to come. He values himself more than I thought. The, the reward I offered was not enough. I must simply offer a bigger reward. So he sends another group of messengers. And as we read, he sent now more princes than before and more honorable than those who came previously, by which he wanted to uh, suggest that uh, Balaam can expect an even bigger reward, riches and honors that would be bestowed on him if only he did his job. Balaam knew the Lord's, the Lord's mind on the issue, but because he loved money, he went to the Lord once again to ask whether he should go or not. And here we've got the first mistake on the part of Balaam. When the second group of messengers came, he shouldn't have let them stay for the night uh, because during the night he was to talk to the Lord. He already knew the Lord's mind on this issue, but he hoped that one way or another he would be able to receive payment. St. Peter tells us that Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. What does it mean? It's, uh, it's worth noticing that he didn't love unrighteousness itself. He only loved the benefits that unrighteousness brought. He loved them more than righteousness, uh, and he would, of course, he would have preferred to gain those benefits without committing any acts of unrighteousness, but reality proved that he was going to stop at nothing to get them. And in answer to Balaam's second inquiry, the Lord let him go with the messengers of Balak. During the journey, Balaam was reproved by his donkey, as we heard in this story. However, even this miracle did not stop his desire to get riches and honors. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, as just as we read, your way is perverse before me. Your way is perverse before me. It was a warning, a final warning to, given to Balaam by the Lord that uh, what he wanted to do was not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Simply the Lord did not approve of, uh, of his desires, of the desires of Balaam's heart. Balaam yearned for wealth and was willing to do anything in his mind to acquire it stopping only where he had to. 
So after coming to Moab, Balaam ordered that altars should be built, sacrifices offered to God. He wanted to maintain an appearance of godliness, even though in his heart he wanted to act contrary to the Lord's will, which he already knew. Balaam uttered a prophecy which did not curse Israel as Barak wanted, but a prophecy that blessed Israel because Balaam's words were inspired by God. Afterwards, uh, Balak took Balaam to another place so that he could curse that part of Israel, which was visible from that place. And once again, instead of a curse, a blessing came out of his lips. Next, Balaam was taken to still another place from which one could see yet another part of Israel. And uh, Balak insisted that Balaam curse at least this part of Israel, but unfortunately for him, for the third time, there was a blessing instead of a curse. And uh, that's how the story ends in the 24th chapter of the book of Numbers. And Balaam's behavior shows that he was a double-minded man. We know about such uh, people because Apostle James, in the first chapter of his epistle, verse 8, mentions that there are double-minded people. What is a double-minded person? What is such a per what is this person like? Well, uh, it is as if two different opposing minds existed in this uh, person. I wonder whether you remember some cartoons because I remember some cartoons from my childhood when there was a character in them who had to decide what to do, and uh, this was shown by first. Uh, uh, something appeared next to his mind that told him to do one thing, the devil telling him to do one evil thing, and then on the other side of his head, an angel appeared and told him to do the good uh, thing. So double-minded, two minds, and you must make your decision because you cannot do two opposing things if they are contrary, one to, uh, the, one to the other. So on the, in the case of Balaam, on the one hand, he wanted to be the Lord's prophet and utter his words. On the other hand, he desired riches and honors that are connected with the opposition. He wanted to have that which the Lord's pro pro providence did not think proper for him. Before him, he had two ways, the way of righteousness and the way of unrighteousness, a God's way and the way of riches. Which of them did he choose with all his cards? Well, neither. He tried to walk both ways simultaneously. He attempted to be the Lord's servant and his mouthpiece, and at the same time he tried to obtain the rewards unrighteousness brought. That's why we say he was a double-minded man. And we can also say that, unfortunately, Balaam's case is not an isolated one. He wasn't the only one who acted like that and behaved like that. There have always been people who have Balaam's spirit. Our Lord Jesus warned against the spirit, saying, you cannot serve God and mammon. Such people find out that after some time, the Lord rejects from his fellowship those who ponder unrighteousness in their hearts, those who even though they don't serve unrighteousness, love its rewards just like Balaam did. Balaam feared the Lord and as his prophet could not even think about doing anything in any other way than strictly according to the letter of God's words. However, he did not have the Lord's spirit. As a result, when he was offered payment for cursing Israel, he was inclined to do it. To put it bluntly, he wanted to do it. He wanted to curse Israel in order to get the riches and honors that Balak was promising to him. And even though outwardly he refrained from doing anything that he was not told to do by the Lord, he wanted to do bad things. In one of the Mana comments, Brother Russell writes that there are those who desire evil things in their hearts but they stop themselves from doing them because they know that they are forbidden. That's uh, why they are always subject to temptations, because 
uh, they would like to do evil things, but they know that they are evil, so they try to stop themselves from doing them, but they are tempted all the time because they have uh, affection for, they love these evil things, and because of this love for evil things, uh, the temptations come, that's where they arise. And keeping such evil desires in uh, one's heart leads to the Lord of the Lord's spirit, and after some time will surely show itself outwardly. In their acts and words, there will appear things which they would never do, words which they would never utter, if they were the had the Lord's spirit still in their hearts. Such Christians will exhibit the spirit of this world, the spirit of selfishness, a tendency to be proud or boastful, an urge to acquire riches and honors at any price, just as was the case with Balaam. The Proverbs tell us, chapter 23, verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Yeah. A verse we know very well, it's one of the main mana verses, uh, so we know it. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Which means that the thoughts which you keep in your heart, your heart's desires, the thoughts you ponder, you consider for a long time, they tend to shape your character, they change you. Not just a passing thought, because a passing thought leaves almost no trace in your heart. But if you think about something for a long time, and especially if your affections attach to these thoughts, that you like thinking about it, it gives you pleasure, such things are shaping your personality, so are shaping your character. And uh, that's what the Proverbs says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And Jesus adds, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's Matthew 6, uh, verse 21. Jesus revealed the truth that what a person values most is where their heart is. A person's time, attention, actions, and energy will be focused on whatever they value above all else. Those who attach their affections to earthly things will have difficulty in avoiding the snares which accompany them. They are in danger of becoming like the third kind of soil in the parable of the soils, also known as the parable of the sower. So the third kind of soil was the thorny soil, which did not yield a crop not because the soil was shallow or because it wasn't rich enough, but because the thorns sprang up and choked the seeds. As Jesus explained himself, it mean the thorns mean represent the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and they make such people unfruitful, that they don't bring fruit just as the fourth kind of soil was the only one which brought fruit. Uh, when we consider this parable of the sower and the four kinds of soil mentioned here, we can say that this third kind of soil is the most tragic one, because the first two kinds is soil completely unsuitable for the gospel age. These are the people whom God is not interested in the gospel age at all. For them is the millennial age, because for such people, as are represented in the first and second kind of soil, gaining salvation in the difficult conditions of the gospel age is an impossibility. They simply cannot do it. But the third kind of soil is just as good a soil as the soil in the fourth kind. The only difference is that the third kind of soil has thorns, and the fourth kind of soil doesn't have thorns, and uh, in the fourth kind of soil, the, since there are no thorns, they do not choke the seeds and the, such uh, bring uh, harvest, bring, uh, allow the seeds to grow and uh, produce effects. So let us return to our story of Balaam. Knowing the Lord's mind, after the first time he went to the Lord, Balaam should have been contented with it 
and ought to have answered the second group of Balak's messengers that not even for a moment will he consider doing something that he already knew to be contrary to the Lord's will. A proposition to act contrary to the Lord's will in exchange for money should have been an insult to him, but it wasn't. Knowing the Lord's will, he should not have asked the second time what the Lord's mind was. It was mocking the Lord or making fun of the Lord. It was as if he was asking the Lord, dear Lord, maybe you happened to change your mind, because if you did, I could earn some money. Yeah, that's what, in fact, it meant his uh, behavior. It was disrespectful towards the Lord. Balaam's heart was not right, which was revealed by his going the second time to inquire of the Lord, and by the fact that even the miracle with the donkey did not make him realize his evil way. Balaam was pushing forward in his evil course. He was still a prophet of the Lord, but with each moment of his enjoying the thoughts of the riches to be gained, he was ceasing to be a holy prophet. Love of money led to a terrible degradation in the prophet's heart. True are the words of Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And how many men, thousands if not millions, have learned that it is really so? Uh, we could read uh, this whole fragment which deals with this subject in the first Timothy chapter 6 verses from 6 to 10 where we can read now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out and having food and clothing with these we shall be content for those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We can say that Balaam's godliness was not combined with contentment, and therefore it was not a great gain for him. Even though outwardly he was still in harmony with God, as he had not uttered any false prophecy, his inner harmony with God had ceased. The thing which was at first only a little blemish, a virus, was developing into a spiritual illness which eventually led to his spiritual death and devoured everything that was true and noble in him. The love of money debases a man, results in his degradation, and kills the more noble qualities in a man. And we can say that today nearly the whole world is more or less ill with this illness. Okay? And uh, here I will uh, quote not something from the Bible, but something from this uh, world. Probably you have uh, heard about such a Canadian singer it was I, uh, some years ago it was a big hit so i you, you must have heard about this song i mean the song by Sh shania or shania twain it's probably it's uh, called entitled catching yeah, i'm sure you've heard it and the, i will now quote the lyrics of this song because they describe the situation of today's world very nicely and uh, in this song she sings we live in a greedy little world that teaches every little boy and girl to, may, to earn as much as they can possibly, then turn around and spend it foolishly. We've created us a credit card mess to spend the money that we don't possess. Our religion is to go and blow it all. So it's shopping every Sunday at the mall. All we ever want is more, a lot more than we had before. So take me to the nearest store. Can you hear it ring? It makes you wanna sing. It's such a beautiful thing, catching. 
lots of diamond rings, the happiness it brings. You live like a king with lots of money and things. When you are broke, go and get a loan. Take out another mortgage on your home. Consolidate so you can afford to go and spend some more when you get bored. And that's the philosophy of the world, especially the Western civilization uh, in, in which we all live. And uh, Balaam also wanted to live like a king with lots of money and things, which made him lose his intimate communion with the Lord and made him become a great sinner, a warning to others for all eternity. Just as other sins, this one was also born in his heart. Thomas Akempis, who was a medieval monk, he was greatly praised and highly recommended by Brother Johnson, in his, who mentions him in his writing as a member of the church class. Thomas Akempis, in his book, The Imitation of Christ, writes, First, a mere thought comes to mind then strong imagination followed by pleasure, evil delight and consent. Thus, because he is not resisted in the beginning, Satan gains full entry. And the longer a man delays in resisting, so much the weaker does he become each day, while the strength of the enemy grows against him. With Balaam, the desire for money and honors started to guide his conduct. In his card arose a thought to gain riches and honors, and it ignited his imagination as he began to imagine how satisfying it would be to be rich. He started to delight in what he would do if he were rich, how more pleasant and how easier his life would be. Apostle Jude, speaking of apostates, says in Jude 1.11, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Apostle Jude says about such, have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit. So, he calls Balaam a greedy person who was erring because he wanted to gain profits. And this man of God wallowed in the mud of sin in order to obtain the riches offered to him. Uh, Numbers chapters 22 through 24 do not tell us that, but we know from other passages of the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testament, that Balaam wanting to gain the riches and honors so much and not being able to curse Israel gave Balak advice on how to cause Israel to fall from divine grace. He told uh, Balak that he was not able to curse Israel as they were blessed by the Lord, but he added that the Lord's blessing was with them because they were God's people trying to keep his law and abide by it. The only way to bring a curse on them was to make them become unfaithful or disobedient to the Lord. So he informed Balak that the more he managed to draw them into sin and idolatry, the more the curse would fall on them. And Balak contacted the Midianites and together they devised a plan according to which the women of Moab and Midian invited Israelites to the sacrifices offered to their heathen gods, at which Israelites committed harlotry with the women and trespassed against the Lord. And in this way, Israel was drawn into idolatry and adultery. I think Brother Adam talked about it yesterday during his uh, discourse. The, it is described in Numbers chapter 25, verses from 1 to 3. And God allowed this lesson to happen. He could have thwarted all these machinations, but he let Israelites go through them so that thanks to the experience with evil, the Israelites would learn some lessons and that we may also benefit by looking at them, at what they did and what it resulted in. Balaam's plan succeeded. 
some Midianite women were able to seduce a few leaders among the Israelites and to convince them to participate in idolatry and adultery. In accordance with the terms of their covenant made at Sinai, a plague started in the camp of Israel and it killed 24,000 of Israelites. It's, it's uh, described in Numbers chapter 24. Because God's uh, covenant with Israel said that as long as they were faithful to the Lord and obeyed his law, their enemies would not be able to overcome them. The Lord would bless them in all their temporal affairs and they would continue to be his people. For disobedience, they were promised all kinds of chastisement, diseases, plagues, fever, terror, droughts, famines, disasters in wars, subjugation to other nations, desolation, scattering among the nations. It is all specified in Leviticus chapter 26. All these disasters were to be a punishment to them, but also a lesson and a warning to deter them from sinning against the Lord in the future. And we can say that the same is true for spiritual Israel today, which means it is true for us. The Lord has pledged that he will bless us in all our spiritual affairs, that he will guide all the circumstances of our lives for our spiritual advantage. He has promised that as long as we are faithful to him, our enemies, Satan, the world and the flesh, will not overcome us. It does not mean that uh, no falls will happen to us at all. It means that even if they do happen, they will not harm our spiritual health. If they come, it means that we need them to learn some lessons, and under the Lord's providence, we can turn them into stepping stones to greater character development. It is so as long as we are loyal to the Lord. If we turn away from the Lord, he chastises us to make us turn back from our evil way, just as he did with fleshly Israelites in the lesson which we are analyzing now. God punished not only the Israelites in accordance with the law covenant, but he also punished the Midianites and he punished Balaam. If we went to Numbers chapter 31, verses from 1 to 18, there we can read that after this experience with adultery and idolatry, after this was all defeated and Israel came, returned to keeping the law after the plague which killed 24,000 Israelites, God told Moses, take 1,000 warriors from each tribe of Israel, so 12,000 soldiers in total, and send them to take revenge on the Midianites for what they had done to you. And this is what happened. The Midianites were killed, all of them. Their scheming against Israel turned against them and led to their destruction. And what a tragic turn of events it was because the Midianites as a nation related to Israel were to be spared. Had they left Israel in peace, they would have continued to exist and live in peace themselves. A good lesson for everybody, not to go against God in anything, because it will turn against you and you will do harm to yourself, yourself. It might be added that Balaam, who was staying with the Midianites at that time, probably still advising them how to best work against Israel, he was also slain by the Israeli expeditionary force. Yeah, the 31st chapter of the book of Numbers states, uh, states that, that they also killed with the sword Balaam, the son of Baal. And that was his end and his punishment for what he did. And the last time Balaam is mentioned in the Bible, it's in the book of Revelation, in the last book of the New Testament. In Revelation 2.14, our Lord foretold that some of his followers will go Balaam's way and for earthly gain will put obstacles on the way of their brethren. 
it signifies adultery and false worship at a higher spiritual level. And it happened just as the Lord had foretold. The adultery was joining the church to the state, thus creating an unholy union by joining two elements that should have remained separate. And eating things sacrificed to idols, oh, I forgot to read this uh, scripture, so let's read it. We are, I'm close to the finish. One minute and we are finished, but I would like to read this because I started to explaining what the scripture means without reading it and no, every, not everybody knows the Bible by heart. I, I don't, maybe somebody knows uh, him. So the book Revelation 2, 14, where the Lord says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to the name no, sorry, I'm reading 13. No, I was supposed to read 14. So once again, but I have a few things against you because you uh, have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality or to commit adul adultery in all the versions. So this adultery mentioned here is joining the church with the state, thus creating this unholy union, which for many centuries existed during the gospel age in uh, Europe. And eating things sacrificed to idols means accepting false teachings and making them, making them one's spiritual food, because eating food signifies feeding your mind with teachings. That's uh, what it is meant. And the apostate nominal church did all these things in the early Middle Ages, thus creating the great harlot of Revelation chapter 17, because they went Balaam's way to change what the Lord commands in order to gain earthly riches and honors. Our Lord, when he was leaving the earth, he told his followers to wait for him. Because when he comes back, he said he would take them and they would rule together. Well, a very nice promise. But centuries are passing and the Lord is not coming back. So the church started to look for somebody else for another bridegroom, for somebody who could give them the ruling and the riches and honors which they started to desire because they went Balaam's way. And that all, all that resulted in the creation of the great Babylon. So the story of Balaam is a warning of, uh, to us not to be greedy and not to desire earthly, earthly riches and honors because going this way will surely lead to trouble possibly even to spiritual death and uh, destruction so let us remember about Balaam let us not imitate him there are many other better uh, role models uh, shown in the bible for us to follow thank you for your attention